there and welcome once again to our In Search of Christianity brought to you by Bible Talk and on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself we want to greet you in the wonderful precious name of our Lord and Savior Amen. Jesus Christ and we're just blessed that you can join us yes. and I'll remind you right off the bat that we'd love to have your participation in this mm -hmm. and you can do that probably the easiest way is through Facebook uh, In Search of Christianity facebook.com in slash in search of Christianity and you can post questions and comments and suggestions there and we can converse yeah. together yes so <clears throat> the technology of today yes uh, I just want to say that for the past two weeks we've been talking about holiness humility and hope in the last three weeks mm -hmm. and I, I want to get into some of the mechanics of that so to speak in this program today but before we do that, I'm going to ask Brother Mark if you'll ask God's blessing on our time together. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, it says where two or three are gathered, you're here with us. Yes, so, Lord, Thank just you. calm our minds and our hearts and give them peace so we may understand and incorporate into our lives your word. Amen. Amen. Amen incorporate the word into our lives because yes. if uh, you're a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word you're in big trouble well you're, you're wasting time you're ineffectual what, is what, what the word of God says it. what use is it that's right so I want to I start by saying this be prepared da -da. that's the Boy Scout motto you know yes. and the Boy Scouts were formed I think I think they were actually formed in England I'm pretty sure of that back in like 1907 or 1908 and that's been their motto from the beginning is be prepared. I want to talk about us if, if indeed these are the last days. Mm -hmm. You know what? I don't know when Jesus is coming back but I know he said be prepared. Yes. Okay? That's right. So I think that's a goal for us and that should be a great desire for us and if that does become that desire when our focus is on Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And you can pray about peace. Mm -hmm. But remember that Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. For I go to prepare a place. It says that he himself is our peace. Yes. So it's being in the word, living the word, that will give you that perfect peace. Okay? Yes. I'm going to start here. I want to, and, and I know we've talked about this in some of the previous programs. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist. Yes. The angel Gabriel was sent to Zacharias. Mm -hmm. Okay, who would be John's father. Right. And Gabriel was sent to prophesy the birth of his son John. And he foretold Zacharias what the ministry of John would be. And I'm going to read from Luke chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, to, to quote what Gabriel said. Speaking of John the Baptist. Mm. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Hallelujah. John the Baptist, his ministry was to be a, a forerunner, to go before mm -hmm and prepare the way for the Lord, right? A voice crying out in the wilderness. So what was that voice crying out? I mean, very simply, the message of John the Baptist can be summed up, I, I think, in this. Repent. Exactly. Which means to change your mind, change the way you think. Mm -hmm. Turn from your sin. But not just to turn from sin, mm -hmm. but see, the rest of his message was this. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's a turn from sin and turn to the Savior who takes away the sin, right? Yes. So, with that in mind, thinking about God's purpose in sending John to prepare a people for his coming, there has to be a time when God the Father knows that 
time, mm -hmm. time itself is running short. Yes. And he will once again prepare his people for the second coming of Jesus yes. Christ, all right? Yes. Now, being prepared, I don't know if you're aware of this, uh, and I know we have a lot of people watching from different parts of the world, actually. Mm -hmm. But here in the United States, there's kind of a phenomenon that's going on. It's called preppers, mm -hmm. right? These yes. are people who are preparing. They're not preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ, but they're preparing for the collapse of society, what they see as the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. they're, they're preparing for whatever their vision is of the coming destruction of the world. That's right. Well, I want to tell you something. You can't prepare yourself. There's nothing earthly that you can do to prepare yourself for what God is going to bring on the earth. That's right. Okay? I know, and the interesting thing to me is that there's a lot of ministries that are participating in this. Mm -hmm. A lot of there's a lot of ministries who are actually selling, profiting from this, yeah, selling, selling you know, little pots of this and that. And now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna deal with that, but I'm gonna I, I do want to talk about this. All right. The word of God, Jesus Christ Himself said this. Mm -hmm. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Matthew 24, that's verses 42 to 44. But, you know, you look at the world around you and you see the things so much that the, the signs... Because remember in Matthew 24 earlier, the disciples, what brought this about was the disciples came to Jesus and said, tell us, what is, what's going to be the signs of the end of the age in your coming? And if you haven't read that, go read it. Mm. All right? But the, the signs are there. Most of those things have been happening throughout time. So I think logically it has to be an increase just in the amount of these things. I got a dear brother. He's been involved in our ministry for... 35 years, and he's a, a good New Yorker like us, maybe a little more New York-y. <laughs> but every time, we, you know, he and I talk each week, we pray together each week by telephone. He's uh, about 700 miles away from us here. And he always gives me this New York thing every time we talk. He, he'll say to me, what's happening? Mm. Now, it's a typical New York greeting, what's happening? To which my answer has always consistently for 35 years been to him, Wars and rumors of war, right. famines in diverse places. And every, I mean, week every week, yes. Every week, yes. The same question. Every week, he gets the same answer. So these things have been going on, but you still you need to know that there is an appointed time. Mm -hmm. Don't be fooled. You know, Peter said in the last days, mockers will come with a mock where they're mocking, saying, "Where's the promise of his coming?" It's coming, and so many of the signs are there. Just look at the world all around you. All right. So, we want to look at these things and assess them, but you know, if he doesn't come to get us, we're going to go to him. Mm -hmm. And life is fragile, yes. and you had better be prepared, one way or the other, to meet your maker, mm -hmm. okay? But here's one of the things I, I want to say, okay? okay? Now, I just read that verse. Jesus said that you need to be on the alert, right? Mm -hmm. You need to be prepared. But I think that we, the followers, the disciples of Jesus Christ, who desire to live according to his word and the, and the, the instruction of his life, the life he lived and the words he spoke, yes. there's something more spiritually deep than being prepared. And that is being prepared. Now, if you follow our Bible Talk website at all, you'll, you'll see that's a word that I use commonly that God put on my heart a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I try not to prepare things. I try to prepare things. That's right. Because I want everything that I do to be based on what I've heard from Him. Mm -hmm. Because if it's not, think about the logic of this. Whatever is not done in faith is sin. Mm -hmm. And without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't say anything on his own. He didn't say anything unless he heard it from the Father. Yes. So his preparation was praying to the Father. Mm -hmm. He was always pre-praying, pre-praying 
for whatever was coming to him, right? I think that's an attitude that we have to get into. And I know that, you know, I, I've intimated this many times in the past during the course of these studies, mm -hmm. that there is nothing more important than our relationship with God. And our prayer life is not just us talking to him, mm -hmm. but it's a conversation with him. Right. So we need to be hearing from God, otherwise you will not be prepared. You will be listening to the world and you will be, the world will be giving you the instruction on what you need to do to be ready for what's coming in your life. You know what? Don't get it wrong. Like I said, the message of John the Baptist was change the way you think. Yes. Right? And it says we're not, to, we're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. You're either going to be thinking the way the world does, mm -hmm. or you're going to be instructed by the Word of God, which is profitable, Paul wrote to Timothy, right? For correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. Mm -hmm. That's the place we have to get to. If you're going to be prepared for anything, it, it had better be because you are pre-prayed. It's a very good point. Well, yes. I, I, really, I really would <clears throat> ask that you contemplate that, that you think about that, and see the wisdom of that statement, all right? And make it the habit of your life, regardless of what you're doing, no matter what you're confronted with, whether it's a situation at home, whether it's a situation with your health, with your marriage, with your job, with what's going on in your, your the congregation you're part of, everything had better be founded on what you are hearing from God. Okay? I, just, I want to read another passage from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 25, right after 24, which is still basically going on the same way. Jesus said, he told a parable, he said, then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Hallelujah, the bridegroom's mm -hmm. coming. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day or the hour. Be on the alert. We are so easily distracted, and that is one of the schemes of the devil, is to distract us from having our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ and our minds set on the things above. Okay? Right. Now, we, as, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, over the last three weeks, we've looked at holiness, Humility and hope. Now, I, I, want, I want to put that in some context regarding the last days. So I'm going to read, and I'd like you to turn with me, if you have a Bible. And you should. And you certainly should. <laughs> this being a Bible study. To 2 Timothy chapter 3. Okay? You there? Not yet. Okay, almost there. Second Timothy chapter 3, starting at the first verse. Now this is Paul writing to his son in the faith, Timothy, and he says, But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Well, that, that's what it says. The, my typical Bible is the New American Standard. The, the, the King James says, in the last days, perilous times will come. Not difficult. Mm. You know, a lot of people find, yeah, there's a big difference. A lot of people find balancing a checkbook difficult. There's, that doesn't mean if you don't, if you, you know, if you don't remember to carry the two and do this, somebody's going to kill you to death. Perilous is being in absolute danger. Yes. All right? And in the last days, they, the times will be perilous. You know, the only time, the word that's used there, translated Difficult in the New American Standard and perilous in the King James. 
It's only used in one other place in Scripture, and that's in Matthew chapter 8. So I'm going to read you that to put this in context. The Scripture interprets the Scripture. Yes. Right? When he, Jesus, came to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. Well, that term, extremely violent, that's the exact same word in Greek that's translated here as difficult or perilous. I think, I think the only logical conclusion to come to is that the best understanding of this is that it's going to be, the last days are going to be a time of demonic rage. Because that's what it was talking about in Matthew 8. Yes. That's what perilous is, demonic rage. Now, you don't have to look far. Turn on your television or the radio, open a newspaper, anywhere you go, you are going to see around, not just around us here, around the here and the world, there is a rage going on. There is a demonic rage. Every day. Every single day. There is a rage that is erupting in violence, mm. lawlessness, like, I don't know, we've never seen before in my lifetime. No. I, have to, and I, don't I think I, in the history of the world it's been like no. this before. Well, I, I'm, I'm old, but not that old. But I, <laughs> but I know in my lifetime, boy, it's, it is a very, very different place today yes. here in the United States, okay? So, how does this start? What, what is the peril? That's a good question. Okay. It starts in verse 2. Here is the peril. For men will be lovers of self. I'm going to stop right there, right? Okay. Yes. We'll go through this list a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the first thing, the top, the number one, and I believe it's there for a reason. God is a God of good order, right? Is because it opens the gate to all of the rest. For men will be lovers of self. We live... Well, you've always said... The way it's written, there's a reason. Absolutely, absolutely. There's an order that God has absolutely. chosen. Absolutely. You know, we're reading here uh, in Second Timothy chapter three, mm -hmm. and a little later on in verse sixteen, it starts saying, "All Scripture is God breathed. Every word has purpose, mm -hmm. and the order God is a God of good order. He's not a God of confusion. Has purpose, yes. right?" It's like, you know, in Proverbs chapter 6 where it says that there are six things, yea, even seven, that are an abomination to the Lord. The first one is haughty eyes. The first one is pride. Yes. And I've always said that that's, that's because Amen. that opens the door to all the rest of the sin. Yes. And I believe that's the same thing, that, that, that the same case is true here. That the first one, lovers of self, opens the door to all of the rest of the perils and the dangers. Wouldn't you say that lovers of self would be pride? It is. Without doubt. Without doubt. Lovers of self. You know, cameras have been around for a while. I, I think cameras have been around. I know used, I've seen photographs that were taken during the Civil War. Uh, obviously, right. you know, yeah. they, were, they were very, they were not very sophisticated, uh, but there were cameras around. We live in an age of selfies. Yes. Now, I want to tell you something. When did that start? Not, not... 25 years ago, no. not not 15 well, years ago. On the phone. I mean, this it, is this is yeah. a new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It used to go. You go on vacation and you take pictures of people stuff. and stuff. Yes. Now you take a it picture of stuff. you with the stuff. It's totally backwards the, the way it, it used to be. I, you know, it's interesting. I, maybe I find it interesting because I just happened flipping through the news the other day. Um, I was watching a news show and they, there was an, just a, a clip they were showing from some professional sport game. I don't even know what it was, a baseball game. It was a, a baseball game or a basketball game. And they showed this group of girls, maybe like 10 girls, and they're in the stands at this game. Mm -hmm. They're not paying any attention to the game whatsoever. And they showed them, and they had the camera on these girls, and all they're doing is taking pictures of themselves oh at the game. There is such a focus on self that we have come to incorporate this into our language. This whole phenomena of selfies, that people are so engrossed taking pictures of themselves. All right? It's reinforced in everything we hear and say. 
But selfies is not about the camera. No. It's about the attitude that's underlying. Right. right. It's about I'm what's important. Right. You know, I'm I'm what my world revolves around me. So I got to take pictures of me. Um, being a lover of self, you know, years ago, Alice and I were in California, and I was going somewhere to preach, and we had stopped at a McDonald's on the way. I think we were going from Los Angeles up to the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. So when I got to this church that next that Sunday morning, God gave me a sermon, and my sermon was, "I know that the world is coming to an end because I got." ice in my Diet Coke and pickles on my hamburger. Now, if that puts a little, is that quizzical? Okay. Here's the reason why. Because one of the signs, the first sign here of the last days is being a lover of self. You know, everything is a matter of balance. And it says an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. And I'm going to tell you the truth. The more you love yourself in this worldly way, the less capacity you have to love others right. because your attention is focused on yourself rather than on on others so you know stopping in this place and it was, was so common i i at that time i used to drink a lot of diet coke i don't anymore and i would always ask for the diet coke without water without really? water, ice <laughs> ice frozen water i'm only half wrong frozen water and it was the rarest thing in the world for me to get it without ice that's right and I asked for, I don't want any pickles on the hamburger. Well, I get the hamburger with pickles and I get the Diet Coke with ice. Why? Because the person behind the counter, generally a, a young person, but not necessarily, they were focused on something other than me, the customer, when they were taking my order. Maybe they were thinking about a date they had that evening or something. Well, they just weren't thinking. But, well, they were thinking, but they were thinking about themselves rather than about me. Because when you're a lover of self, you become careless about others. Now, think about that, right? Carelessness, just take the word. Yes. It's just caring less. Caring less about what? Others. You're caring about yourself. Your focus is yourself, right? Mm -hmm. I actually wound up doing, uh, because I did seminars, I did biblical principles in the workplace seminars, and that was one of the things I taught about was the fact that you see so much carelessness out in the world, and there's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. It's because people don't care about you. They care about themselves. Their mind is not on you, all right? So, that is also sad to say the focus of too much going on in the church today. Absolutely. You know, it's about, you walk into a church and you hear a teaching, or I, I, I am hesitant to call it a preaching, mm -hmm. But the message is about, you know, you come in and the message is about you. Yes. How you can be healthier and wealthier. and, and what, I mean, it's all about what you can get. It's all about that. Building up your self-esteem. How rare is it? And I don't say, I've said this before, I have to say it again. I don't say this for judgment or condemnation. I say it for correction. Yes. How often do you go into a church building on a Sunday and hear a sermon that is based on... This verse, which, by the way, can be found in all the Gospels and in other places, when Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's from Matthew 16. But it's in Mark, it's in Luke, it's in John, it's certainly in the writings of, of Paul, right? You know, it says he's got to deny himself. I thought it's interesting because Young's literal translation of the Bible mm -hmm. doesn't translate it, deny it, deny yourself. It's, it says disown himself. Oh, wow. And, you know, studying the, the Greek term there, the Greek word, that's a good translation. Yes. It may very well be the most literal translation. Right. To disown yourself rather than deny yourself. You see, because the Apostle oh, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price? Mm -hmm. To disown yourself is to understand that you are not your own. 
As long as your focus is on you, as long as you think that you're in charge of your life, you're in control of your life, your life is all about you, you're going to be violating this, this word. That's a truth. Now, I said this is all about holiness and humility. You see, because it's all about our life is supposed to be about being set apart and consecrated to be used by God for His purpose. Yes. That's holiness. Yes. All right? That takes humility because it means surrendering to Him and to His will. Is not the ultimate picture of humility. This is a rhetorical question. Mm. Jesus Christ praying. Here is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the King of glory. And here is He praying saying, Not my will, but thy will be done. That's humility. Yes. But it is based on understanding that His will is surrendered to God the Father. All right? It's about pride. Pride gets in the way of humility. Pride is the killer of, of humility. All right? Yes. Humility is abasing yourself, thinking more of others than you do of yourself. Pride is thinking more of yourself than you do of anything else. Aren't they the antithesis They are, of absolutely. Other? Absolutely. Absolutely. So... Remember John 10.10. 10. Remember, you know, Jesus said that, that, that Satan, he, he's a thief. He comes to kill, to steal, to, to destroy, right? He wants to destroy. One of the things he wants to do is to destroy the abundant life, the prosperous life that Jesus came to give us. Right. And he does that by taking, you know, Satan has no creative power. No. He can't create anything. He can only pervert right. the truth. So he has a prosperity message, a, a message of abundance. It is a perversion of God's truth. Yes. It is a perversion of Jesus saying, you want to be blessed? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Yes. All right? I, I want to say, I don't know if I can get this in, but I want to tell you my theology about need. Right? Yeah. I know for a fact, and I've, I've lived this, I believe it, I know it to be the truth. My God shall supply all of my needs through His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. That, my friend, is the truth. But that said, if I have a need, he is as likely to give that very thing that I need to somebody over there rather than to me. Mm -hmm. What? That's what the scripture says. Because that's the way God works. You know, if my tummy gets hungry, my hand has to reach out and take food, bring it to my mouth, which will chew it, and get swallowed. The body has to work as a whole, right? Okay. Uh, I, I want to read from 2 Corinthians. It says, For if the readiness is present, talking about giving, it is acceptable according to what a person has, mm -hmm. not according to what he does not have. For this is not for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need, so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need, that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. 2 Corinthians 8, 12 to 15. My point is that if God gives that thing that I need to John over there, John, who loves me, now has something that he didn't need, so he has abundance. That abundance is there for him to meet my need. Yes. If you see your brother in need. And then we both get blessed. Yes. But if you believe the word of God, who gets blessed more? Him. More Did Jesus not say? Yes, it's more blessed to give than to receive. But both of us get blessed. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna leave right now on this. I'm gonna read from Acts 4, 32 and 34 to 34. The congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And abundant grace was on them all, for there was not a needy person among them. Hallelujah. God bless you. And goodbye till next week. Of lost sinners